Hey everyone, welcome to the Tory Birch Foundation webinar on negotiation. I'm Gabrielle Raymond McGee, the Chief Operating Officer of the Tory Birch Foundation. Today we're going to tackle the critical topic of how to ask for more for you and your business. We're going to erase all those fears you may have on negotiation. I know when I think of negotiation, it's intimidating, it's daunting, and we're gonna remove all those fears today. You may be feeling like in the midst of COVID and the uncertainty of the times, you don't even know what you need right now. And my hope is that you will use this workshop for time and space to ask those questions and really hone in on what you need right now. So um, I am so excited that we are fortunate to have the leading expert on this topic, Alexandra Carter. Alex is a professor at Columbia Law. She's been a mediator for the United Nations and she's the author of the best-selling book, Ask for More. So welcome, Alex. I'm, I'm so grateful you're here. Gabrielle, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So Alex, before we dive in, I just wanna remind everyone of two things. First, we're here for you. And second, this web series was designed for you. So please ask questions, don't be shy. We have the Q&A box below, type those questions. I will monitor throughout as will Alex. And Alex, over to you. All right, Gabrielle and Molly and everybody at the Tory Birch Foundation, I want to thank you so much for having me here today. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with all of you. And so I'd like to let you know, and just to echo Gabrielle's comment, I do a lot of mediation work in the courts of New York City. And so I promise it is not possible to distract me. In fact, an active Q&A bar is my love language. And so I hope in the spirit of being here for you that you'll ask your questions and participate as much as you can in this format. And I'll get to as many of those questions as possible. All right, and with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our uh, seminar today. This is on Ask for More, and it's about ways that you can negotiate with confidence no matter what the circumstances or the stage of your business. So since this is a negotiation uh, webinar, I first wanted to engage with the way that we think about negotiation. And I'm wondering how many of you learned the same definition that perhaps Gabrielle and I both did as a young professional. Okay, so the way I was taught about negotiation was basically that it was a back and forth between two or more people to get to an agreement, usually over money. So if I was, you know, in a corporation, negotiation would be that thing I did when I went in to my manager once a year and said, hi, I'm Alex Carter. Uh, keep me in mind when you're making your compensation decisions. Or as an entrepreneur, you know, that negotiation is something you do when you have a new product to offer and you're about to sign a client or you have an agreement that's come up and you need to renegotiate. So it's about deals. Or unfortunately, negotiation is what happens when you end up in court and then you have to figure out a way to settle out of it. All right, over time, I started to realize as a conflict resolution expert that this was a really narrow, limited, and unappealing way to think about negotiation. It was almost reactive. Like you only negotiate a little bit as Gabrielle was talking about when you feel like you have to. And then I learned a new way to think about it. I learned this. And so here's where I'm gonna go to you for the first time. And I'd love it if in the Q&A, you would drop me a note to let me know what this picture has to do with negotiation. So I'm gonna take a look in the Q&A now and you can put your comments in there. What does this picture have to do with negotiation? Oh, I love it, okay. We have Chris saying possibilities. Shika's Place saying choices, threading the needle, says Saxon. Uh, we have options, says Camila. Desiree says navigating pathways. 
Katarina says charting new waters. Okay, we have a ton of great answers here. Donna also says navigating. And I'm gonna go um, with what Donna and Iris and several other people have said now. Hawa as well, a ton of great stuff. Laura, it's as though I wanna know how many people have read my book already. This is it. Negotiation, when you get in a kayak, what are you doing? You are steering. So this goes back to back in 2006 when I went to Hawaii on my honeymoon and my husband and I got in a kayak, which could be a whole separate course on team negotiation, by the way, but we get in a kayak and the guide turns around to us and says, please negotiate your kayaks to the left so we can wind up on that beach over there. And that was the moment as a young professional that my brain clicked and I thought, there's more than one way to think about negotiation. If I'm negotiating my kayak toward that beach, what am I doing? I'm steering. And so these days I teach that negotiation is not just the money conversations. It's not just the resource conversations. And it's not just the few rounds of offers before a deal with the client. Negotiation is any conversation where I am steering a relationship. And I'm gonna get more into that in just a minute and what it means for entrepreneurs. But there's just one problem, isn't there? Let's look at this beautiful picture. Um, gorgeous, serene waters. We are drinking in this beautiful scenery. I don't know about all of you on this call, but this is a little closer maybe to what I have experienced over the last few months. And I'm guessing the same is true for you, that maybe it's less about drinking in the beautiful scenery and an abundance of deals, and maybe it's a little bit more about trying to save the deals you do have, save the clients who are already there, and thinking about how do I not and my business not end up on the rocks. And so the good news I have for you today is that the approach to negotiation I'm gonna teach you works very well for this. But I can also tell you, both from research and from personal hard-won experience, that it works exceptionally well for this. And I wanna give you tools today, specific tools that you can use, whether you are in the serene or whether you are in the stormy waters of entrepreneurship. So here we are. Negotiation is any conversation in which you are steering a relationship. What that means is every conversation you have with someone is an opportunity to teach them how to value you, how to think about you and your expertise, and to steer that relationship for mutual gain over the long term. And of course, if negotiation is steering, what is the most important relationship of our lives? It's the one we have with ourselves. And so the first stop in any negotiation is not the moment you sit down with somebody else. It starts at home with you. And today, I wanna teach you tools that you can use to steer that internal conversation, which is the critical first step for any negotiation success. All right, so a lot of times people will ask me, well, Alex, if negotiation is steering, what is the most effective way to steer? The answer is somewhat counterintuitive. I think a lot of us assume or we're taught that negotiation proficiency means you make the most forceful arguments or you practice how you're gonna make those arguments. In fact, the best negotiators are the people who ask the right questions. Let me give you two pieces of research on this. So the first is on leadership. And there was a study done by an organizational psychologist that found that the greatest quality of an effective leader was self-awareness. And that the way these leaders cultivated self-awareness, they knew themselves, they knew their strengths, they knew their weaknesses, they knew how they could lead, and they knew the team they needed to build around them. The way they achieved that was to ask themselves the right questions. That is the first stop in any negotiation. And then once we sit down with each other, so let's say Hawa and I are sitting down to negotiate, the best way that I can be an effective negotiator is not to go in and start making my demands of her, but rather to start by asking the right questions. 
there was a study done out of the Kellogg School at Northwestern Business School where they found that 93% of people are not asking the right questions in negotiation to get the most out of it. And I'm not just talking about generating the most trust, although that's what I want for you, but I'm talking about generating the most money. It turns out when you ask the right questions first, you end up making better deals for yourself. So let's talk about how to do that. So the approach that I'm going to teach you today is the one that I wrote in my book, Ask for More, 10 Questions to Negotiate Anything. And it's just that, it's 10 questions. Five of them are questions you ask yourself. And this is what I call the mirror section. And it's because I found now coaching a ton of people, whether they are diplomats at the UN, whether they are um, CEOs of large companies or CEOs of startups, the most common mistake I found people made was that they hadn't taken the time to ask themselves the right questions before they got in the room with somebody else. Then once you do sit down with somebody else, I want you to be in that 7% of people that knows the right questions to ask. And so those five questions are called the window section, to open up a window between you and somebody else. So together, these can help you get more from any negotiation. Now, in this limited time, we can't go through all 10. What I have done is I've picked out two questions from each of the sections, two you should ask yourself and two you should ask somebody else. I'm going to tell you how they might apply to entrepreneurs and then we're gonna move forward to do a few more things to teach you ways that you can use these tools to advocate for yourself during this difficult time. All right, so here is the mirror section. Again, we know that negotiation starts at home with us. The goal here is to ask open questions to uncover your biggest goals, your interests, your feelings, and your solutions. You know, we got some questions uh, in advance of the webinar today, a lot of excellent questions. Some of them centered around this concept of, you know, how do I hold fast to my value? What is the best way to negotiate in this difficult uh, circumstance? And what I tell people is your source of power in negotiation is not bluster or aggression, it's your knowledge. I want you to arrive at the table with the most rock solid knowledge of yourself and your situation. That is your seat of power. All right, so here we go. Are you ready for the first question? I was talking to the Wall Street Journal last month. They asked me, Alex, where should every negotiation start? And here it is. What's the problem I want to solve? The truth is that a lot of times in negotiation, we can almost panic and start jumping to solutions first. Let's give an entrepreneur example. I worked with a startup company this spring that had a large segment of their business that was distributing products through coffee houses. <laughs> coffee houses closed, so they lost an entire revenue stream. And so immediately they said, okay, so we need to start reaching out to every potential customer we have and try to make up our revenue for this quarter. And I said, hold on, let's back up. What is the problem we are trying to solve? Are we just trying to get money in the door for May or for June at any cost? Or are we trying to figure out how to pivot your business for the long term so that you can raise your next round of financing? Because if it's the second one, then we don't wanna be reaching out to everybody possible. We want to be thinking about your best clients, not the ones who will do one order and then you have to figure out how to make it up again the next month, but the clients who will be with you for that quarter and beyond. So figuring out the problem you want to solve is so key. It's like being in the kayak and saying, that's the beach I want to hit. Right? Otherwise, you paddle all day to figure out you've solved the wrong problem. So anytime you are facing something in your business, even if it's an interpersonal issue with a colleague, you know, thinking about what is the problem I want to solve here? Is it that I want to help this person gain additional skills so that they're going to be more useful to me in this one area? Is it is the problem I want to solve that maybe this person isn't a good fit and I need to figure out how to let that go? 
start by defining the problem first. Okay, this is a great question to start any negotiation and I'm happy to take questions about this throughout. Let me move to the next question I want you to ask yourself before you sit down with anybody else. And this gets to, we had a comment um, before the webinar. Somebody wrote in and said, you know, what do I do if I'm starting my business and I need to tell a story to investors, but I've never started a business before. How do I do that? Okay, here's the question I want you to be asking yourself. How have I handled this successfully in the past? All right, let me break down this question. I think a lot of us before we get into negotiation almost psych ourselves out. We tell ourselves it's going to be nerve wracking. We may even think back to a time when we negotiated before and it didn't go well. How many of you have done that? I know I've done that in the past. Do you know there's a ton of research to show that if you go into a negotiation with somebody else and you've thought about a time that you were successful, you are more likely to do better in that negotiation. Whether it's about money, whether it's about a job, you are gonna get better results. So you should ask yourself this question before you sit down with someone just because asking it will put you in the state of mind to do better. But the second reason to ask yourself about a prior success before you go in to negotiate is because frequently this question is a data generator. So let's say, for example, Gabrielle is approaching a situation where she's got to advocate for herself around a price increase, okay? And she's thinking about this and she's concerned about it. She looks back and says, okay, how have I handled this successfully in the past? And she remembers that once before, two years ago, she needed to make a price increase. She would then, Gabrielle would then write down all the strategies she used to make herself successful there and see which of those applied to this situation, okay? So if you have a direct prior success that's comparable, use that, write your strategies down. Now, I know some of you are thinking this. Okay, great, Alex. This question is fine if you have a direct prior success, but what if I'm trying to do something I've never done before? Okay, I have something for you. And I feel you because a lot of us right now are doing things we've never done before. We've never dealt with a global pandemic on this uh, scale. And so a lot of us are navigating through that. But I'm willing to bet that you have a prior success that relates to this in some way. So for example, the comment came in to Gabrielle before saying, well, you know, this is the first time I'm starting my business how do I convince people of my success? I want you to look back then at the thing that you're most proud of from your life before you became an entrepreneur. I've asked this question to entrepreneurs all over the country. I said, okay, if you're new to starting a business, tell me about a prior success that you were really proud of in your previous work life. One woman said, I went from being entry level to being a senior vice president in my, in my company. Great, write down those strategies. Another woman said to me, well, I've never started a business before, but my husband died and I raised two children on my own. If you can do that, I want you to write down the strategies that made you successful at that. And I'm telling you that some of the things you did to enable yourself to show up and get through that will help you grow your business. So no matter what the prior success is, if it's something that really means a lot to you, write down the strategies and then see what you might be able to use for this particular situation. I'm gonna take a moment now and look here at the um, uh, questions. Okay, um, somebody wrote, I have a business that requires business owners allowing me to come on site to offer my services. It doesn't cost them anything but allowing me outside space. How do I get them to agree to allow me on site? Lunice, I have an answer for you and on how to ask for that, and it's gonna go all the way to the last slide in this presentation, okay? So I want you to hang on, and I'm gonna answer that question on the last slide. All right, so these are the two questions that I would pull out for this time to have you ask yourself. Let's now move to the window section where we're thinking about, again, if you want to get into a negotiation and have the biggest chance of persuading somebody else, whether it's to allow you on site, 
whether it's to sign up with you as an entrepreneur, whether it's to raise a round of financing, the best way to approach that is to ask questions first. Because when you understand the other person's goals, their needs, and their concerns, you are going to generate better deals. The fact is that a lot of us ask questions, we just don't ask the right ones. But when we do, going to the last bullet point here, not only does somebody want to do one deal with you, maybe they say, okay, you can stay outside our building on this day. But when you take the time to ask them questions, they're more likely to say, you know what, let's make this a permanent arrangement. And that's what I want for you. Okay. So I'm going to go to a quick exercise here. This is about asking other people the right questions and what questions you can ask to uncover the most information. So here we are. I tell you that I recently took a family vacation and you'd like to get as much information as possible from me about that vacation. What do you ask me? And I'm going to go to the Q&A and I will go ahead and answer your questions. So feel free. What questions do you want to ask me about my family vacation? All right. Ah, okay. Where did I go? Asks Rosie. Rosie, I went to um, Cape Cod. Mira asks, um, how was your experience? Um, Mira, it was joyful. Pizzazz also asking where. See, a lot of people ask me, where did you go? This is an example of a question that seems open, but really is pretty narrow, right? Because if you ask me where I went, the real answer to that question is Cape Cod. Doesn't give you a lot of information. How long did you go? Three days. Um, somebody else, ah, somebody said, what was your favorite thing about your family vacation, says Julie. My favorite thing was getting to have lunch with my father on Father's Day. How many people were with you? Two. Um, ah, okay, here we are. So Danny at 1.25 p.m. and Katie uh, at also at 1.25 came up with the magic question. The biggest question you can ask me about my family vacation is, tell me about your family vacation, Alex. So if you were to say, so if Danny or Katie, I think there are other people who got that answer, if you were to ask me, tell me about your family vacation, here's what I would say. I would say, I went to Cape Cod for a few days with my family and with my brothers and their families. And the reason we went is that back in May, when my book was published, my father, who's already terminally ill and living in a facility, was diagnosed with COVID and was given 24 hours to live. So I thought that my father was going to die the week that my book came out but he didn't die. He hung in there, he retested negative. And so after one of the worst periods of my entire life, talk about a problem that's hard to solve, I saw my father outside, socially distanced for Father's Day at his facility. You can see now how asking a big question, like tell me about your family vacation, gives you so, so much more information than asking, where did you go or how long did you go for? And so in effect, when you ask me that question, tell me, here's what you've done. You know, I select this picture because um, this is uh, from Brazil and I do a lot of teaching in Brazil. And the place where I teach is a fishing city. The way they fish in this city in Brazil, Fortaleza, is they fish with a giant net, a commercial net. The first time I saw this, I thought back to my childhood on Long Island and how I would fish with a line and I would wait all day just to catch one fish, maybe. And it reminded me about the questions we normally ask in life. That normally the questions I might ask my daughter, did you have a good day at school? Or the questions I might ask somebody in the wake of the tremendous movement for racial justice we've been seeing, I might reach out to a black friend and say, are you okay? When you reach out and say, are you okay? Or did you have a good day at school? What's the answer to those? Those are yes or no questions that don't really invite the person to open up. And so instead, I wanted to give you the two magic words to start out all of your negotiations. And those words are, tell me. The fact is that tell me 
is not just something you can ask a friend to get them to open up about a parent who's been terminally ill. This is a question that startup companies can and should use to close deals and to get people to give you the most information possible. Let me give you an example. So the startup company that I um, talked to you about earlier that had the big segment of their business disappear um, called me back during coronavirus because they said, we have a big meeting coming up. So they're a product supplier and they were meeting with a retailer. This was a retailer they desperately wanted to sell to in a new part of the country. They had gone in twice before, twice before they thought, oh, you know, we have this deal. They didn't get the deal. This time they went in, they did not show their glossy pitch deck like they had the two previous times. They sat down and instead said, we're so happy to be here. We've been here twice before. Tell us your view on our product. And then they zipped it. That's it. The distributor, the retailer sat there in silence for a second, kind of stunned. And then she said, okay, you want to know why you didn't get the deal? Here's why you didn't get the deal. I didn't have the data to support that my customers in the Midwest were going to buy this premium product. Recently, I feel like the data has been more mixed and I'm no longer convinced that I was right. So I called you in and bingo, they had the bullseye that they needed to hit. They didn't need to go in and show their whole pitch deck. They just needed to ask her a question. They figured out what the issue was and then they satisfied her issue and won the deal during coronavirus. I want you to practice. Some of you, it seems like already do this, switching your questions to tell me, tell me your view of this situation. Tell me what you're looking for in a contract. I've used this even as an entrepreneur thinking about my speaking business. I don't call companies and say, would you like a negotiation webinar? What's the answer to that? People are going to say, no, it's a yes, no question. Instead, I might call somebody and say, tell me what you're doing to support your negotiators during this time of turbulence. That is a totally different question that opens it up so that they can tell me what they need most. Great, great question. Okay. My final question that I want to give you today is this, how many people here have ever gone into negotiation fearing, oh no, what do I do if they say no, right? The, the fear of the no. And I want you to never fear that again, because all you have to do is ask this question. What are your concerns? That's it. I don't know about you, but in the last three months, four months, however long it's been, I've heard more no's than I ever thought possible. I had a ton of book tour events lined up where I was going to be teaching people in person and people were going to be buying books. And then when the pandemic happened, all of that, I mean, thousands of sales evaporated overnight. People called and said, nope, 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 we're canceling. And people would say, and we don't want to do a virtual event. And I would call up and say, okay, what are your concerns? And when somebody, you know, when you ask somebody what their concerns are, let's say you're marketing your service or a product to them and they say no, and you ask them, what are your concerns? Here's what you're going to uncover. A lot of times people say no, not because you're not worthy or your service isn't worthy. No, they say no because they don't have enough information. They have a question about the timing they may not be the right person to answer this. And so when you ask somebody for their concerns, you give yourself the greatest chance possible of figuring out what the target is that you need to hit. I had this happen over and over again uh, with companies that said, well, we just can't do a virtual event. And I would say, so tell me your concerns. And they would say, well, um, we don't know how to run it. And I said, okay, great. I actually can offer some help in that regard what else? And the other person, you know, the second concern was they were like, well, you know, we're really not sure, you know, if our employees would be receptive to a virtual event. And I said, okay, so how might you figure that out? And they said, well, we could poll them and see if people would want a virtual event. And I'm like, that sounds like a great idea. This one organization polled their employees. They were like, yes, we'd love a virtual event about how to negotiate. And we did the event. Turns out most of the time, I want you to internalize this, the no is not about you. Simply ask people their concerns and more often than not, you will either find a way to turn no to yes or 
you'll have the information that you need to know that maybe this person is not a match for you at this time, which is also good information to have. All right, a final note on negotiation in a crisis. A lot of times people will ask me, well, Alex, in a normal circumstance, I feel like I have plenty of time to um, ask questions. Do I really have time during a pandemic? And the answer is, you don't have time not to. The fact is that a lot of us are under tremendous stress at this time, whether health related, economic related, you know, or just the, you know, the, um, the racial justice and the impact of the killings that have happened, it's a weight on some people more than others. And so when we are under stress, it affects everything about the way we negotiate. In times of crisis, it's so important to ask yourself the questions, to give yourself the clarity you need to move forward. And it's important to ask other people questions to help them, right? To help them um, reduce reactivity and to increase the chance that they will want to continue to do business with you and be in a dialogue with you. All right, so that's about the book. And then I wanted to take just a few minutes to talk to you about specific strategies that women and women of color can use um, to negotiate. And I do this because my mission for Ask For More and for everything I do is not just about negotiation skills. This is my mission. My mission is to achieve empowerment and equity through negotiation. It means that I hope to use this as a vehicle to help each person in this world achieve her highest and best, but more than that, so that we can come together to make sure that people have meaningful seats at the table. You know, not just lip service, but full equity, full inclusion, full parity for people across the board. So I wanted to share a few research and strategies. And I know that Gabrielle and others got questions about this, about, you know, when asking for more isn't enough, um, you know, particularly for um, some women or women of color. And I want to say and acknowledge to you that just because my book is titled Ask for More, you know, and I'm here to empower and equip people does not mean that society should not be asked to do more. And so I see this as a partnership where, you know, people, we, I as a white woman or my sisters of color do the best we can to arm and empower ourselves. And we are also working together to figure out how to change the power structures to reduce some of those very real inequalities that are out there. All right, a couple notes on women and self-advocacy. So a lot of us you know, don't feel the same innate sense of confidence as our male peers. We may say we to talk about something that we, um, that we personally have done. You know, when I should say I, I might say we. Whereas a man might say, well, I did something when really it was a team effort. Sometimes we also tend to presume we can't speak up without knowing every detail, right? So we think of something we wanna say, and then a man says it across the table and everyone says, great point. And we think, oh, I, you know, I could have said that and I held myself back. The other thing is, you know, in this group, we've had a couple of people submit questions, you know, saying, well, I've never started a business before, so how do I stand in that expertise? The fact is that women are more likely to undercut our expertise, you know, to say, well, I've never started a business before, instead of saying, I'm an accomplished professional with all of the tools necessary to drive a company toward profitability. You know, we're less, we're reluctant to say I'm an expert. Here's a real life example. This came from a study that was summarized in the New York Times. A presenter asked a group of women and men whether anybody had expertise in breastfeeding. A man raised his hand. He had watched his wife for a few months, and so he felt he had breastfeeding expertise. Meanwhile, the women in the audience did not raise their hand as experts. You know, so I saw this, and I decided to conduct some research. I went home to my husband, and I said, honey, would you say that you have breastfeeding expertise? And he said, well, you know, our daughter's almost nine, so I don't know if I would say that anymore. Here's the thing, my husband is a full equal partner to me across the board in the home. But when he shows up, he's the expert. He feels really confident in himself. And so it's just a lesson to claim your expertise. And if you need help, call a friend and ask them to help you tell the story of yourself 
in a way that really resonates with all that you have to offer. You know, and I faced this myself, you know, I was talking to um, Gabrielle and Molly about negotiation is a male dominated field. When I decided to write my book, these are the most popular books in the field. And this is what the authors of those books look like. It's eight books, 16 authors, and one woman. And so the last you know, lesson I wanna leave you with about claiming expertise is that when you stand up as an expert, it's actually not a selfish act. It makes space for the women who are coming behind you to say, you know what, I can do it as well. And so I too have experienced this questioning and self-doubt. And now on the other end of this, having published a book and you know, seen it done so well, I want to be here to say that if you've ever held yourself back, there are people out there waiting for you to stand up and claim your expertise and that you have a message nobody else can deliver. There are people waiting for it. Let me give a special note on women of color. And here's where I wanna say that I don't think it's a surprise that I'm here today as a white woman. And so what I'd like to do is, I'm gonna be very clear about what I can speak to and what I can't speak to. And what I can't speak to from my own lived experience, I wanna give you an outstanding woman of color who's a friend um, and ask you to support her work. So as a woman, as a white woman, I walk a tightrope when I advocate for myself between you know, being kind of the nice girl worker bee who doesn't have leadership potential or being overly aggressive. Women of color walk two tightropes because they're at risk for being stereotyped both for being a woman and for being um, black, for example, or Asian Pacific American or Latina. And also women of color are more likely to be asked you know, within companies, something to be mindful of for startups to do office housework or thing that is not compensable. Women of color can feel isolated in the workplace. And here's the thing, you know, women of color need to be provided spaces for like-minded gathering, places where they don't have to explain themselves. People just understand the experience but also spaces where those of us who are not of color can stand up and support them. And I wanna show a way that we can do that. So my colleague, Minda Hartz has a great book called The Memo, What Women of Color Need to Claim Their Seat at the Table. She challenges us to move beyond allyship. She sees being an ally that if I'm an ally, I say, Minda, I, I hope you're successful. I believe in you. Being a success partner means that I take tangible action to support Minda. It's not just my hopes and prayers. I call people and say, I have a colleague, you should hire her. You know, I talk about her when I go places to present. A success partner uses her capital to help her sisters of color succeed and thrive, not just on a professional level, but also by forming personal relationships. And the last thing I wanted to share with you here today, going back to the question that somebody asked me earlier, how do I get somebody to say yes to having me outside their building? It's the same question that I've gotten from people um, in the earlier uh, questions about how do I negotiate with a commercial landlord or other people if I can't meet my obligations? Here's what I want you to know. You have more options than you think. I am an attorney who works in the court systems in New York. Those court systems are barely open and they will be delayed for years. Your commercial landlord knows this. You know, people know this. And so they're not gonna be so quick to sue somebody because they couldn't meet their full obligations. So the way you ask for the most success is to frame it as what I call an I, we. Here's what I'm asking and here's how we all benefit. So if you're trying to figure out how to get a company to allow you outdoor space to conduct business, ask them questions to figure out how you might be able to help them, what their needs are, what their goals are for their business. You're kind of crawling in their brain by asking questions to figure out the target that you need to hit. And then let's say you're selling food, right? And their employees are struggling because they don't have local food choices. You could say, well, here's my, my proposal. I'd like to use your outdoor space and here's how we all benefit because your employees will have um, a place to go get fresh food. If you're thinking about your landlord, you could say, here's what I'm requesting. 
So I need a rent reduction for this period. Let me show you my documentation. And here's how you benefit because it means I won't default. It means you're going to have steady money coming in. And it means that toward the end of the lease, when I've recovered, you're going to receive larger payments. So you'll be whole. When you do an I, we, you help to highlight the common interests. You focus the person on what they can gain rather than what they can lose. And I put here that this is an also a great way to challenge your organization to step up on equity and inclusion, right? By reminding them that when we increase meaningful diversity, when we give people fully supported seats at the table at every level of management, it pays off. We have better ideas. We will be more profitable. We will be leaders in our field. The I, we is so key for so many things. And so with that, um, I know that Gabrielle and others are going to give you ways to stay in with me, both on my website and on my social channels, which I totally welcome. And I'm going to go to the um, Q&A to answer um, some questions here. All right, so let me look. And I think, Gabrielle, if you have any in particular that you want to um, highlight, I am all good to, uh, to have that as well. Thanks, Alex. I know you, you touched on this question a bit, but would love to dive in a, a bit deeper. How do you address the fact that society often blames women or people of color that we don't negotiate and that's why things are not equal. Can you, can you dive into that a bit more? Obviously negotiation is important. We all wanna fish with nets and kayak and steer, um, but it's not an excuse for the lack of equality in our country, especially. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think Gabrielle, that goes back to the point um, that I was making earlier about, you know, um, just because we're asking for more, it doesn't mean that other people shouldn't be um, asked to do more. You know, I um, I refer back to there's a lot of there's a lot of data out there on this. You know, and one study that was done um, actually by uh, the Lean In organization in conjunction with some others found that. You know, it wasn't so much that women aren't asking at the entry level anymore, you know, in companies for salary that caused the huge gap, that some of the bottleneck was caused when people were um, first promoted, so the first promotion, and that the qualifications for that tended to be gendered, that, you know, women might ask for a promotion, but they were disproportionately given to men. And so that is what started a major, major wage gap. So yes, there is substantial data on this. And there's also substantial data, you know, showing that even the wage gap itself, Gabrielle, is a whitewashed statistic. A lot of times we'll talk about, oh, it's, you know, it's 70 something cents on the dollar. Yeah, if you're white, right? If you're Asian, it's actually like maybe 80, 81 cents on the dollar. And if you are black or Latina, it's even lower, right? You are in the 60s or even the high 50s. So we have to be really specific and break out some of that to show that not everybody's equally situated. In fact, just yesterday, I spoke with a very senior woman of color. I I'm talking um, C-suite, okay? At a major company who asked for more money and was told, oh, your husband makes more than enough. It is out there, right? It is absolutely out there. And so part of what I suggest people do there is some research going back to the um, Obama administration about using a technique called amplification, where, you know, if we are running into, you know, these unfortunate or flat out illegal dynamics in the workplace, we have options. One of the things we can do is to amplify each other and to try to increase our power together to leverage people into getting more money, more promotions, or having their voices heard. It's critically important as white women that we are amplifying our sisters of color at the table in every meeting and in everything we do. And in that way, putting some of our capital, which we have withheld for far too long, toward making sure there's true equality in the workplace. Great, well, I know 
Uh, a good friend of the foundation is equal pay uh, activist Lily Ledbetter, and I asked her what what should every woman be doing right now to advance gender equality? And she said, take a negotiation course, but it's not an excuse for inequality. So thanks for addressing that. And we have a question from Mira um, that ties into this. She asks if she should be calling out inequalities that exist when she's negotiating to further support her negotiation and she's speaking as a woman of color. Yeah, okay, this is an extremely challenging question to answer. And I want to acknowledge, first of all, that once again, I'm here as a white woman. I am so sorry you're experiencing this. There's a level of what you're experiencing that I have gone through as a woman. What you've gone through as a woman of color, I have not. So I have consulted extensively with women of color and what they generally say is for them, it's a case by case basis. So they try to see when it's most important for them to spend their capital and then to think about how to spend that. You know, when I was talking to that woman, for example, about the, um, I think, illegal comment she received, okay, about like, oh, your husband makes more than enough. And she asked me, what would I do in that situation? A lot of times, my first go-to is a mediator technique that's very effective. I summarize. So I might say, so, so Bob, you know, let me make sure I get this right. So what you're saying to me, Bob, is we're here to discuss my performance and my compensation for my job. And you've said that I don't need more compensation because my husband makes more than enough. Did I get that right? Sometimes just hearing that the other person will start to recollect that this doesn't sound good and they may pivot off that. If they don't, then I go to my second mediator technique, which is to say, can you tell me more about that? Silence, okay? So sometimes opening it up a little bit can be useful. The other thing that high powered women of color I know have done is they have gone to their allies in the organization. So if they were having trouble with an immediate like white woman supervisor, they might go to a white man who was up the chain and say, I need some help. And that is some of the way then that they have squashed some of the more serious aggressions that they have um, faced. Antonella is asking when she's negotiating and she's dealing with negative or closed off people on the other side of the negotiation, how can she get them to tell me more um, when they're closed off. What are, what are your tips around that? Yeah, Antonella, great, great question. Okay, so here's what I would say. I've been in lots of situations where I've asked my beautiful open questions and people give me the Jersey salute, right? Because they're, they're stressed out or something is going on. So what I do, Antonella, and I live in New Jersey, by the way. Um, so um, what I tell people to do then is to focus on any way you can to build trust. One way I can do that is Antonella, the summarizing technique that I've used where I talked about the negative boss, you could use it here. If somebody says, you know, this is, I don't have time for this. I might say, you know, God, I'm, I'm so sorry. It sounds like you've been incredibly pressed at work. You know, what's, what's this time period been like for you? I might just try to get them to open up even about themselves, what they're going through, do some of what I call stroking, like acknowledging them. This has to be so hard, right? Other times, Antonella, I just try to find anything in common with that person. I might look them up online and be like, oh my gosh, Antonella, I, I happen to notice that we went to the same college or I see you're also from Long Island. Where on Long Island are you from? If I can find any points of connection in, then we build a little bit of trust and then I can return to my question. So find a way to build trust and a connection. Oh, you know, Gabrielle, can I answer a question here? Heidi right below has said, any advice on how to keep personal feelings and negotiation and emotions out of your negotiation? I'm gonna bet a lot of people have that question. So Heidi, awesome, awesome question. I have stuff about feelings in the book. Basically, the bad news I have for you, Heidi, is that you can't keep them out of the negotiation but you can use them effectively. What I want you to do, Heidi, is before you get into every negotiation, I want you to write down, what do I feel? And then I want you to write down the good, the bad, and the truly ugly that you wish you did not feel. Why? 
it's because there are certain emotions that we feel that if we don't acknowledge them, like for example, fear or guilt, if we don't acknowledge those emotions, I call them the big two, they will come back to haunt you in your negotiation like the monster at the end of the action movie, okay? So I want you to write those down in advance and then when you do that, you're gonna find, Heidi, that you release some of that and you're grounded in how you feel as you walk into that. Great, Alex, I know we have so many entrepreneurs that are dealing with wholesale partners right now and we've received many questions about how do you negotiate with a wholesaler when you're not receiving payment from them but they have your goods. Um, we know this is a really tough time for both wholesalers and small business owners. So any tips on how to put your foot down and get what you deserve? Yeah, absolutely. So um, such a good question. Again, I think, you know, there are many ways that people could approach this. Let me tell you about the approach I take. I have found, Gabrielle and others, that when I lead by treating people as human beings and acknowledge that they are struggling, that they end up wanting to do more for me than if I went in there guns blazing. Of course, there's a time when people are not meeting obligations at all and ducking you that you have to think about options. But I think I would try to take the approach and say, hey, listen, humanize yourself a little bit to them. Say, I'm sure this is a challenging time. You know, I, you know, we haven't received payment or the goods. I know that this must be rough. I want you to know that on my end, it is also rough. I'm trying to figure out how I can satisfy my obligations. I have my family that I'm trying to support. I would love for us to sit down on Zoom. My goal is to figure out a way that we can work this out. So be clear about the problem you want to solve. And sometimes that will help bring people back to the table. You also want to be really clear on, you know those mirror questions I, I said? You want to arrive at that table figuring out the problem you need to solve, what it is that you need, maybe any feelings you have about the situation and with a plan of action so that you can be concrete in what you are proposing to them, right? But lead with a little bit of understanding them and letting them know that you're not just some company, you're a person at that company and you too need to find a solution. Nihaj is asking how you negotiate with a company when your budget is much less than what they're used to, I guess, working with. Um, so how do you convince someone to work with you even though your budget is much lower than um, they'd like it to be? Yeah, really good question. Okay, so here's what I would say. You know, in, in the book and in my work, I teach that people's actions are driven by their needs, okay? And needs are what drive us to spend our time and our money, okay? Now, needs can be monetary, right? They might, so this is the type of situation where, Gabrielle, let me just make sure I'm getting it right. So this person is the one with the budget and it's a smaller budget than what the other party is used to? Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so then I'd be thinking, okay, so um, we're gonna be able to pay them less money. How else? can I satisfy their needs, right? So I would start out that conversation by asking them about their business. What types of clients do they like to work for most? And all of that, why? Because I know a lot of people in industries who when presented with a smaller budget will still go with that person because they satisfy some of their other needs. You know, for example, I work with a friend um, who's an art advisor. She represents people looking to buy art. A lot of times the artist will sell to somebody who is not the highest bidder because they receive a letter from that person saying, here's why I was drawn to your art. Here's what I plan to do with it. And here are the values that I uphold in my collection. If you find out what somebody needs and you can satisfy an additional need of theirs, maybe you could say, well, I noticed, let's say this is about me as a speaker, okay, and, and like, or, or them as a speaker, and I'm a company, right, and, um, you know, it's a smaller budget. You might say, well, it's a smaller budget, but you've never worked with somebody like this before. You've done all this work in another sector, so we could be fulfilling something important for you. It's a smaller budget, but it's a new type of work, and that could be great for your long-term story of your business, right? So, Again, here's what I'm requesting. We have a smaller budget and here's how we're gonna benefit 
and maybe we'll give you a testimonial, that type of thing. So think through the other person's benefits as well. Absolutely. Helena is asking, she says she's working with a state regulator advocating for her company, but she's been labeled as aggressive, which many women have been, um, and she's made no real progress with this person. So how can she reset the conversation and make progress for her company despite her label? Okay. All right. So, um, Helena, I'm very sorry that you have experienced this. And, and there are a few things I loathe more than the A word. Um, aggressive, right? A lot of times this is coded language um, for something else. So here's what I would um, say there. If you need to be talking to this person again, right, and to reset the conversation, you know, you're, you're probably going to want to figure out you need to be intentional about it. So first I would consider like how much do you need this precise relationship because if you really need this person alone, okay, then you might have to suck it up a little bit initially and say, listen, right, it's been a super stressful time, right? I hear that the way we have communicated before has not, uh, has not been um, you know, effective for you. Here's my goal, right? I would love to right, talk to you a bit about what we do. I understand things have been challenging in state you know, regulation. So in other words, try to find a way to acknowledge them right? And again, I wonder if there's something they need that you could help with, right? So the key is really figuring out, you know, this state regulator is like anybody else. He needs you to write his victory speech. He needs you to propose something to him that he can go and sell up the chain and people are going to be like, wow, Bob, you know, great job on that initiative. So any way you can figure out like what he needs and then be intentional and say, my goal for this is to help you right? Bing, 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 while we are also helping ourselves. And if he really like refuses to talk to you, then I think maybe you need to get a good cop involved, right? Sometimes I'll do this. If somebody won't talk to you, I've spoken to entrepreneurs who said this, they were trying to work with a particular buy it from tar buyer from Target and the Target buyer hated them. And so they were like, all right, I'll get somebody else on my team to be like, oh, I'm, I'm working with this person. And then it's a good cop, bad cop thing, and maybe the person gets over it. Good luck. I, I wish you the best. Critty um, just started a new nail, nail service for women, and she's trying to figure out how to, how to convert more customers into taking her service, because obviously prospective customers are the key to her business. So maybe this is something on persuasion, but what tips do you have for Critty? Yeah, Kriti, this is great, right? So I would think, you know, one suggestion I have for you is, you know, some of the questions in the book, you can almost answer on behalf of your prospective customer. So like, what is their problem that you're trying to solve? So like, what is the particular client? Because nail services can apply to a large number of people, right? I don't know, Kriti, whether you are like, in like on location nail services, you're having people come to a particular place. So figuring out who your customer is and what problem of theirs you're solving. The second thing is I would figure out what's holding them back or what could be holding them back. What are their concerns from coming to see you, Kriti? If you were to find out, for example, that maybe I would love to get my nails done, but I'm not sure I can do it during coronavirus, is it safe? then one of the ways you can do that is to address that safety concern. Another concern people might have might be around cost, right? And so you could think, are there packages or other things that people um, might do? You know, so thinking about whatever um, hangups people might have and answering those is usually a good way to convert to more sales. Great. So Alex, I know we're out of time, but do you have any Final tips or words for our community today? Um, yeah, you know, I, I just want to say that um, I know during a pandemic, it can be extremely challenging. And one of the things I worry about is that women, sometimes we feel like we're just lucky to be in the positions we are on an ordinary day. And during a pandemic, you know, we don't have the right, we can, you know, we should just be grateful. We can't ask for more. And I want you to know that you can simultaneously be grateful for what you have. I know I am. And 
you can still ask for more and stand in your value. And so anytime I train people, I tell them that we're now colleagues for life. I say the same to you. And so I hope and expect that you will stay in touch with me through my website, through my social channels. Let me know everything that you go on to do. And I look forward to seeing your success. Well, thank you, Alex. This has been wonderful. Can you remind everyone how they can follow you? Because I know everyone's going to want to stay in touch. Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me on my website, which is alexcarterasks.com. You can sign up for my list there. I give tips and I'll be giving some courses later in the year. You can also follow me on Instagram at Alexandra B. Carter. And I'm on LinkedIn and uh, Facebook as well. And if you did want to support Ask For More, um, we are sold everywhere books are sold online. Um, at Amazon, at Bookshop, and elsewhere. And it's fantastic. I read it the first week it came out, and I even had a Zoom book club with other women, and we all um, asked really hard questions that we never take time to think through. So thank you for, for giving us all the invitation to ask for more. Um, Alex, stay in touch. I know everyone will will want to follow you and continue this journey and this is just the beginning for everyone in learning about negotiation and and uh kayaking in a clear way so thanks alex um everyone sign up for our webinar next week don't forget we'll be back with amber williams who's a brand strategist copywriter she was with us two weeks ago and everyone asked for her to come back um so don't miss that and Make sure you're following along on the ToriBirchFoundation.org website. We have our financial FAQ that answers all of your most pressing questions around financing your business. Important to note that once again, PPP, the deadline has changed. So it's now August 8th, and you can read all about that on our website. If you've missed any of our past webinars, check out the Tory Birch Foundation YouTube channel, and you can rewatch this session with Alex on that channel. So be on the lookout for that. And thank you, Alex. This has been incredible. Everyone be well. Thanks so much, Gabrielle thank and everybody. Take care. Take care.